That's right. It's another episode of According to Flint, a little slice of my world, uh, Western sports the last few times. This time I'm going back to a true passion of mine. As everyone who has ever been friends with me knows, I have a passion for music and we've brought that to this podcast before. Uh, this week, this this time we're going with a little different angle, a little bit of songwriting. And I told him before we went on the air, he is the third most famous songwriter that I am friends with. Oh, Beautiful Mess, uh, Brand New Girlfriend, International thriller. Harvester, Thriller. He is <laughs> our friend, Shane Miner, coming to us uh, from the oh, Nashville yeah. area. Hello, Shane. Good to see you, bro. Well, good to see you, Flint. How are you? I I'm miss good. you already. I know, and everyone should know we have... It recently returned from the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo, which was in Texas this year. I do Outside the Barrel slash According to Flint on stage, the show right after mine, <coughs> clinging as hard as he can to my coattail. <laughs> Cowboy true. Revival. It's true. That's true. Cowboy, Cowboy Revival. Cowboy Revival with Shane Miner. Great show. Um, you know, bringing songwriters on, musicians, art artists. I'll say artists. Song singers slash sure. songwriters you know the, the point every day you made on your cowboy revival show was we want to bring country music back to what you the way i interpreted what you think country music should be where what direction is country music gone you know you and i never really got to sit and talk backstage right. so what did it do what, what I happened I, I think it just it just steered off of true country music and I mean, I know every generation has their version of country music. I mean, you go back and listen to the 60s and 70s, it progressed. And, and, and I get that, I understand, but there's still a silver lining. There's a common, a common thread, rather, is better. There's a common thread. You got, to, you got your, you know, it's content. Uh, you got cheating and drinking and just life story songs. You got steel guitars, fiddles, just country sound that made country music, gave it the integrity and made it what it is. You know, and now, and I'm not, and, and I, the last thing I wanted to do with this show is beat anybody up or, or uh, uh, what's the right way to say it? Just, I'm not bashing on anyone. I just think oh. there's room for it all. You know, there is. It's like I said, I said, as I, I never understood how some of these artists that come out of Nashville that are really country get told, man, you're just too country. I'm like, we're in freaking country music. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I, like, it's like, really? And I mean, go ahead and play the pop and the, and the bro country. Those guys are buddies of mine. Absolutely play them. But play the country guys, too. I hate to see the integrity of, I'm not, you know, the music. I hate to see the integrity just watered down and chipped away at. I mean, those guys like George Strait and George Jones and Alan Jackson and goes back even further. They created a legacy. Well, what's the next generation? Are they going to have any of that legacy left? Is there going to be anything left of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what? I have <clears throat> uh, the kind of the the sense that I bring to it, we all, we can look back. I mean, our generation, does anybody not know Amarillo by morning? You know, just picking one out of the blue. Does anybody not know? We can go through country music and have these songs. We all know the words to mama tried. There's one. What right. does this, uh, you know, I've said there's some songs right now that are really big and I've said 15 years, nobody's going to remember this song. It doesn't touch you. It does nothing in here. Right. Right. I, you know what, Flint? I'll, I've written those. I've written a song like that or two where I'm just looking. I, I like it, but I'm looking back. Yeah. Nobody's going to nobody's going to remember that song. But it didn't it didn't it wasn't earth moving, you know, it yeah. changed lives. But, yeah, I'm with you. And, and, and to answer the question that the statement that you just said, I don't know if it was a question, but there are people. These new guys come into town sometimes or get in the music business <laughs> that don't know who George Strait is. Yeah. In country music. What's your favorite George Strait song? Uh, who, he, he was, he, who was he again? Yeah. It's like, what? I mean, I mean, at least know something that you're getting into. If you, you know what I mean? Know the business if you're yeah. truly country. Um, I don't know. I just think, I think it's just, I don't know what happened to it. It somehow it, it progressed and wanted to be part of the cool crowd and it let the integrity down it let people in that weren't necessarily country. They were talented. They just might've been in the wrong genre. Yeah. You know, it'd be like, it'd be like me showing up to a rodeo with a bull rope to ride Bronx. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I'm entering, this, I'm entering the saddle Bronx, but I got a bull rope and shaps, everybody. I'm ready to go. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and not, yeah. And I don't want to beat this topic. You know, we have good things to talk about, but I'll never, 
uh, it's been two, three years ago, I was in Nashville for the PBR and I've become friends with Stormy Warren. Uh, great guy. Great. Uh, love Stormy. And love I was down doing uh, an interview on the highway, the XM station, the highway, and a commercial. And we were talking about who we know who's been in. And I said, you know, I'm friends with Cody Johnson. And I said, my, my 18 year old daughters love that guy. Do you get, you guys don't play him much. And he said, my bosses won't play him. That's true. And I he, said, why? And he said, I don't know. I got to do what they say. Then they did. Once he came to town and kind of did this, then they played it. But that, that's a perfect example. Right. It's like kiss the ring, right? A little bit. Yeah. It, it really is. And so, okay. But I've seen a lot of these guys like Cody Johnson come through town that kiss the ring and kiss butts and asses and everything else, and they still don't play them. And yeah. they get told, man, you're just too country. And I know these guys, and I know they're talented. It's not like they're not talented. These guys and girls, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, I know. I know. Um, and I don't want to beat it up. I like say, I, even the guys that aren't country, you and I know these people, that, and they're great artists. They might not necessarily be traditional country or not even traditional, up-to-date. I mean, I like up-to-date stuff, too. But these guys are – there's some country guys that are doing that stuff that are dear friends of mine. And I love them dearly. I just think, and I think they would tell you too, there's room for it all. They should play country music. It's country yeah. music we're in. Um, for everybody's reference, by the way, and I want to get to more of kind of what you do on your show at the NFR. Hopefully we'll be back in Vegas next year, make it bigger and better. But it went well, better than I, we could have imagined in Fort Worth. It, it really oh. went well as far as crowds and connections there, didn't you think? 100%. And I mean, you helped drive that too because everybody knew who doesn't know you. Come on. My girls, my girl, listen, I have a 14 year old, a 13 year old and an eight year old. Okay. The eight year old's too young, but the third, the 14 and the 13 year old only wanted to go to Fort Worth and hang out at my show because you were there. They care less about me. <laughs> I picked that. I picked that up. You know, and, my, and, and, and they loved you by the way. You know, um, I have girls too. And as long as you're bringing up your girls, your oldest daughter, picks up a guitar. She sang on stage with Wynn Varble. What, <laughs> is there anything pr more proud than when your girls pick up something? I mean, I could see it in your eyes. It was in my eyes when my girls sang the anthem at the PBR finals. Yeah. Man, when your girls pick something up, uh, there's some pride there. And your oldest daughter, what, what's your, uh, Maggie. 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 Yeah. She goes up and sings. Listen, she's the voice worthy. I mean, that girl's talented, Shane. Well, it, she doesn't get it from me. I don't know. Maybe she got it from her real dad. <laughs> uh, that's that's good. My wife, Brooke, I go, am I her dad? Really? Hey, he really? My, Be honest with me. But everywhere I'd go, my dad, people <laughs> go to a show and I'm with my dad after and they'd go, man, are you his dad? And he'd, he'd always say, nah, I don't know, but I'm married to his mother. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But that's hey, awesome. she, Maggie's good. She is. Well, she's legit. You know what? Thank you. She does work hard. I, she's one of those girls that I don't push to like to do this. Matter of fact, I've tried to be an encouraging father, but also I've kind of told her the reality. I said, look, it's tough on girls because it's, it's a guy's sport and it's in, and, and there are some girls that break through, but you know, I never really paid attention to it till, you know, until I had daughters and I'm like, you know, it's, it's tough. It's just, it is the way it is. Don't be mad about it. Just go work harder than everybody else. If that's truly what you want to do, but just know getting into it, it's hard and it's tough. And if you're willing and you put in the hours and uh, she accepts it and she does, I, I have to tell her to quit practicing. Hey, stop, put, put the guitar down, put, quit singing, just relax, go be a kid for a minute. You know, and she, she high school rodeo, she barrel races and I'm, all the kids are into that, but she loves doing it. But I appreciate you saying that. She thinks the world of you. Uh, well, listen, the, the music business is however you want to describe it. It's hard. It's, it's slimy. It's it it you never know what's going on. Why? I can turn on the radio right now on a, on a country station and count on two hands in the midst of a day how many women, so, songs by women are played. Why? Why is that? I don't. It's, why is that? I mean, you can name them. I, I mean, it's Carrie Underwood and Miranda Lambert, and after that, take your yeah, pick. I know, right? You yeah. And Reba a little bit still? A little how about bit. her career? A little bit. Shania's kind of gone, isn't she? They don't really, yeah. other than reoccurring songs, right? It, it, it what why is there a reason uh, that's I, I'm, I mean I guess I'm putting you on the spot there no I don't why. know yeah I don't I think I don't know I'm guessing right now is it is it 
I don't know. Is there just a lot of, is, is the party animal singing the country music on the tailgates rocking? Is it more, is that a guy's thing, a guy's statement? Is it, I don't know. I don't know. I think there should be more women in country music. I do. Yeah. I'm not playing on no movement. I really do. But I just don't, I think, I don't Who are they? Well, it's good. To, it's good for everybody. It, it mixes yeah. things yeah. up. It, um, did, didn't you tour, by the way, I should say you did, I say songwriter, you were a singer too. By the way, I did one of the greatest things I've done in weeks. Uh, I pulled up the video to Slave to the Habit today on YouTube. <laughs> Shane, Shane Miners, well, 99, 1999? Yeah, 1999. It got nominated for like video awards. That was in the heat of everything having a video. That was back when they played videos. But right. listen, listen, the hair, the leather oh. pants, the oh. glittery jacket, my friend. Oh, listen, last season, and that, that's everything I'm talking about. That's when, when I came to town, labels were and god bless them they were trying they were trying it was a different time they were trying to make things work and i came to town as just a rodeo kid that they knew from out west and was singing the honky tonks and bars and they basically tried to make me the male shania and so i fought it tooth and toenail i mean i, I fought i didn't the songs i cut i didn't want to cut but it was a different time they told you what to cut I brought them in hit songs that, that they were like, ah, he ain't cutting that, and ended up winning Grammys. Other people cut these songs. And it was a great experience. It was one, I, I, I guess that's why I'm good at helping with artists, young artists. I'm good at telling them, here's what you don't do. You be true to yourself. You don't listen to anybody else. If, you, if, if, you're, if, you, if it's you that's really being you, you will be believable and people will buy you. They buy what's real. People know the difference. Yeah. And I think that's where I can help. And, you know, I did, I have helped. You know, one thing I like about what you write, what your songs are, and I like about our conversations, we're exactly the same age. I don't know if you know that. I'm, we're 29. I'm about, I'm about yeah, I'm 29, uh, going on 38. Our, our birthdays are like four months apart, honestly. So we have, we have the same references. Everything right. we talk about, whether it's movie quotes, references in life, what we went through, those same age people, we always, you know, that, that's a great thing. So, so I get that. So we were in school at the same time in that same era because I look at kids now in school and I don't think their personalities are as strong. I was a, I was a good athlete, but I was in music too and that was okay. Nobody said a word. I see it now where I go, I go speak to young kids and I say, I was an all-state football player, but in the all-state choir. And they go, Psh. you know. Yeah, what's wrong with that? Music. I think when we, in that mid-late 80s, stronger personalities, independence, we, it was okay to be in music. Uh, did you have that mixture in school? What was, the, what was the kind of school you were in and that flavor of that atmosphere? It was the same thing as you. You could be, you could be in, uh, on, on a football team, a high school rodeo team, and you could be in choir singing. You could be in drama. Nobody said anything, right? Yeah. They just, they just went with it. I mean, everybody was kind of, uh, I don't know. I think they appreciated it more. Is, is you being you, being, you know, being able to be yourself and your personality get out there and everybody was a different personality. It was a melting pot, and that's what you loved about every individual out there, you know? And now it's like laughed at, right? A little yeah. bit. Well, Am I answering your question right? Yeah, when, I, when I'm sitting in a group of 25 kids at a high school, which I've done and have that opportunity, yeah. talking about careers, and I say that, and the boys, I wait for them to kind of go, music. I say, whoa, 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 come here. When you, what, why do you guys always have these ear pods in? What's in there? Right. Music. Right. Right. You right. admire musicians, yet when your friends want to be in choir, or to, I tell you I was in choir, psh, you roll your eyes. Where the hell you think all those musicians come from? I mean, who right. gets all the women? Musicians. Musicians. <laughs> it's the kid with the guitar. Yeah, guitar is he better than any older. women. Yeah. Or, or hey, how about a kid that plays piano? You want to talk about that now? Yeah. Come on. And I mean, and a kid that sings. And I heard you sing, by the way. I heard you sing "One <laughs> Dead or Alive." Let me tell you something, man. Bon Jovi. Oh, every, that whole crowd would have thrown rocks at Bon Jovi hearing you oh, sing that. Man, I'm telling you. Should you should do that. You should do it. <laughs> hey, by the way, speaking of, you said drama in high school. I played yeah. Rolf, uh, Rolf the Messenger Boy in The Sound of Music in high school. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. Did you, you have to sing, I am 18, go, whatever. You, you are 16, go, go on 17. 
<laughs> yeah, that was me, man. I was a no awesome. I turned into You're a no awesome. for God's sakes. Uh, awesome. Yeah. You know, wait, wait, who played, who played, what was the girl's name in Sound of Music? Uh, Le- 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 Liesel? Le- the, you mean the, the girl the I girl. had? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. A uh, uh, mm-hmm. girl uh, at that time, I look back now, I'd have laid it on her now. But I really? was so scared. Two years in a row in the school play, I had to kiss a girl. Two years in a row in front of all my friends. One year it was Laura Dean. The next year it was Jennifer Lucas. I just remembered all. Look at that. I remember. Oh, oh, see, so they stuck. So they were hot. Okay. Yeah. No, <laughs> don't put me on the spot. You can't put me on the spot. <laughs> nowadays, I mean, it was like, mm, but nowadays, no way. I'm No way. Yeah. I'm all no, I'm, act, I'm acting right now. Come on. Do <laughs> I'm it acting. The, don't do it for the integrity of the play. I'm locking in here. Uh, you know there's so much about you i didn't you know we've been friends backstage you've been on my show and you start to look we're just friends and i start to look at things you're related to wyatt earp are you kidding me my grandmother is uh is an earp she's still alive she's 92 we i know we don't tell a whole lot of people that but yeah i literally yeah it's uh it's crazy i grew up in that whole family and yeah, I wasn't even going to talk about that with the labels. And, and back yeah. in the day when they found it out, they wanted to mention. I'm like, I don't know how that helps, but yeah, I've done the whole. Yeah, yeah, there. It, it, yeah, it's crazy. She's a uh, she's like a great great niece because he had so many brothers and half brothers. Why? Sure. And, and and her nephews are our family historian. Was the fa- one of our family historians is my grandmother's nephew. He did the technical advising in the movie Wyatt Earp with Kevin no, Costner. Huh. So yeah, so so. And we got stuff handed down from us that were part of Wyatt Earp's. My cousins got stuff. I got stuff. I got stuff. I got Wyatt Earp's. You know, before he died, he was in the cattle business. Mm-hmm. So the Earp brothers, they would have a circle E on one hip, and then they have a W-E, Wyatt Earp. They, each brother had their own individual brand. I got, I got Wyatt's individual brand and the circle E brand. Really? The actual uh- old brands, yeah, yeah. Crazy. Got Let's go shoot some out. stuff up next time. Let's go, let's go get on our horses and play. I'll be Doc Holiday. You should be. Come on. Um, I love it. It's so tough. I, yeah. Not to get too much into making this a documentary about you, but I, I think everyone, whatever we do in life, I know everything that comes out of my mouth on stage, whether it's in the arena, um, comes from what we've been through in life, whether it's yeah. great things, whether it's heartache, whether yeah. it's other experiences. How did you ever, I want to know how you became a cop in LA. Like what kind, and it had to give you some at least emotional experiences to draw off of. I mean, that's, right. you're a right. songwriter for God's sake. Right. That's what right. it's about, right? Right. And I, you know, how I did it was, I was I started as a writer and I had a little publishing deal in LA and uh, she, we were only paid, you know, eight, $10,000, something like that a year. You can't live on that in Los Angeles. And uh, so what happened was a buddy of mine goes, Hey man, you ought to go to the fire department. You can still work two days on whatever, three days a week and you know, afford to live in LA and you can still write songs. So I thought about it. I went, okay, that's cool. I'll, that, that's really cool. Makes sense. So I, I applied for it. And, um, they had a hiring freeze. And then after the hiring freeze, after they had the hiring freeze, all the overflow applications went to the city. So then next thing I know, you know, I'm, I'm getting, Hey, you ought to try out for LAPD. So I went did the same thing and ended up getting hired by LAPD. And so they all, you know, it was just a stepping stone so I could live there to write songs. It was so expensive because I wasn't in Nashville and I was born in Modesto, North California, raised there. And I stomped around in Oakdale, California is where my stomping grounds were and all up through Bakersfield. So the music business, the only outlet we had really to do anything was LA. And so it was an experience, Flint. I, I, I love cops. I support the boys in blue and the military, the men and women of law. I do. I do. I never respected them. I always respected them, but I never had a respect for them until I became one. Like I do now. I always, I mean, my dad would have beat me if I had talked back to a cop. My dad told the sheriff from where we grew up, he said, if you, you ever catch my son running from you or back talking you, you whoop that ass and you bring all, 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 all finish what's left. And I never did, you know, sure. This is the way I was brought up, but I'll tell you what, man, I was going to work in LA for about, I was going, you know what? I'll try this for a year or so. And man, 
they stuck me in. I was like, well, I'm trying to remember how I'm trying to go back in my mind. It's been a while so I, since I thought about it, but I remember in the academy, I was going to just, you know, graduate from the academy, maybe try it for a year. And so I put it in the cool places. They give you three months for the academy, you know, ends, they give you a chance to go. I'll tell you what, you can pick three places. So I picked Hollywood, Venice Beach, all the cool places. And I think they caught on and they stuck me in Compton, South Central LA. And, uh, it was it was death and mayhem every night and i worked a graveyard shift and it was it was horrible you know it was horrible but it was it was a gift too because there were we got to help a lot of people i got to see the underbelly what the world really don't want you to see and what they don't tell you on the media and you know i'm not afraid to hit hit hot topic buttons so you know i've the cops the whole crooked racist cop thing i worked in the highest part the most controversial time in LAPD and I never once saw what they're talking about. I think that's the exception more than the rule. I think most all cops are good. Uh, if they're there, I'm sure there are a few and those guys don't need to be cops, but I'm telling you it's the exception more than the rule. I never one time saw it in a place. I should have saw it. That, by all numbers and stats, I should have seen that. Never, never, never did. Never did. That's uh, across the board. People are good. But uh, yeah. it, it's the very, yeah. it's the very few that get the media that get the, the camera time. The people are, that's right. You know, that's right. You're exactly right. So exactly hey, right. You talk about Oakdale, Modesto. We, we think of California, especially right now in one way for people who don't know listening, Modesto, Oakdale, that's cowboy country. I mean, oh, that's all cowboy, cowboy country. country. And you, you know, the first day of our show, Ty Murray's there. Like Shane Miner, Ty Murray. I love- you know Ty and Ty. I love Ty. Yes. I love I love man Ty Murray. What a great guy, right? Yeah. I, I mean, know. just unbelievable. I had such I had so many good times with him. One time him and I, did I tell you every time we went to we were talking to you about it. We went to Italy, Germany. Can oh, you yeah. imagine me and, you and Ty Oh my Murray. gosh. Oh, we had a ball. I think one of the, I think it was one night we drug in at four or five in the morning when we were supposed to. I mean the Secretary of Defense looked at me and Ty walking in at four or five in the morning from Germany. And just kind of went, oh, jeez. Man, if I had a nickel for every time I got a dirty look from the Secretary of Defense, I'll tell you. (laughs) I know how you feel. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, but it was a great – you're right. It was a big rodeo town. I mean, Oakdale's cowboy capital of the world. So is Stephenville. I think they almost fight over that deal, right? They do. A little bit. Yeah, Texans always win. Of course. They always win, right? Yeah, apparently (laughs) in today's world. Um, What – is there a point, like, I would love, uh, I, I wish I could play the guitar and piano, for one. The other thing I wish I had in here, I have an ability to sit at this microphone and have a conversation with you. I wish I could put together songwriting, lyrics. Was there a yeah. point when you were maybe high school, 14, 15, something, where you said, man, that's a, that's a great thought. I could... I can do this, like, or did it develop? Is it something I want to do that I'm going to work on it? How does, how does that light go off? I was, I mean, I started singing at a young age in church, you know, really young age, probably four or five years old. And my mom played piano. And so she didn't never had, she never had a lesson, learned to play. She taught herself taught, played by ear. And um, when I was about 12, um, all the music influence in my life. When I was about 12, I started writing songs. I was one, I was probably the kid looking on the records going, Oh, who wrote this? Where I could almost get to know the writers, you know, Bob McDill wrote that. I, I can tell by hearing that Don Williams song coming out. That's gotta be Bob McDill. And I'd get the little 45 record. Boom. There it is. Bob McDill. So I started at 12 years old trying to write my own songs. It was crap, but I started, you know, the whole thing, that 10,000 hours thing, you know what I mean? There's something to that. So all through my life, I just wrote. And I think it's just, you can do it. Anybody can do it. It's words. You necessarily don't even have to get, have, have, I'm not a great guitar player. My parents never got me guitar lessons, not because they were rude about it. We just didn't have time. Partly you know, my parents split up too. So it was, it was time and money and, and the home life was a little different, but so it, that was all good. But still, I mean, you don't have to be able to play guitar or any instrument to write a song. I mean, you can sit there and hum a melody and put it in your phone. And the words that move you, I promise you, if they move you, they're going to move somebody else. I swear to you, you could write a song, Clint. Um, 
Well, I could see. Because you've been through things in your life. Yeah. And I have those things. I write them a lot or I go through them in my head a lot. I have, I have been told that being with me sometimes is like being with a Hallmark card. <laughs> so I should send you thoughts. Then I could get writer credit on a song someday. Uh, why don't why don't you send me send me stuff like hooks and when we go write the songs we get cuts you're one of the writers that's part of it that's in your ideas of the song or maybe lines you came up with absolutely because i know you're just this deep well of experience in life i know you you're a very fascinating guy you're a funny guy but i let me tell you about you what i figured out you're entertaining but i also know that flint gets in his quiet time too and he's got a big old heart right am i right or wrong i uh, you know 12 years you like ago, people 12 years ago i had a heart attack and they found a heart in there they found it <laughs> so it's in there it's in there. it wasn't it wasn't what two times what is that on the grinch what three uh, five it's times? well it's two sizes too small two but sizes now, too small. it grew three sizes today yes yeah, absolutely it did uh, you know <laughs> I, I i jokingly introduced you as the third most famous songwriter i know i i'm good friends with you i'm good friends with win varble you brought yeah. up that i used to i was friends just haven't seen him in a while with bernie toppin who oh my gosh basically wrote elton john's catalog but now it's the weird. reason i bring him up didn't they correct me if i'm wrong didn't they kind of do it where Bernie would bring lyrics and Elton would put the music to it. Is that common? Are you, do you do both or yeah. what, what, tell me that story, how that all works, especially there. They're not all like that. Not all. Some of them have, I've had, I've had situations like that. That's big in the rock and pop world. They'll do that. And, but not necessarily it's in country where it, it does it too. But majority of the time, if a co-write day is like this, I've written hits and Flint's written hits where you're on my calendar and we, you and I meet in an office and we go to write and I look at you and I go, Flint, you got any ideas? Uh, uh, well, I got this, this line, you know, and I got this. And we, we bat it around and go, Oh, let's write that. Let's write that idea. I like that idea better. I think people will relate to that. And we just start banging around on a guitar and try to hum out a cool melody and just start going, okay, what does this idea mean? And just start writing it from our perspective and bouncing it around, you know, just you and I being you and me and, and letting our experiences come through and like not overthinking it too much and just where the common man will understand it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, I, yeah, I do both. And, and so do the other writers. Sometimes we start out with a idea and we don't have a melody. Um, sometimes you start out with a melody and don't have an idea. So it all comes in different ways. You, you bring up a good topic because I actually made a note about it. I always, in my life listening to music thought and i'm sure it, it's both something affects you there's yes. there's love there's loss there's heartache there's uh trauma and you're sitting on your couch in front of your tv and go i gotta put this down i got a song yeah but there's also hey let's get together grind away and write a bunch of songs for an album that am i right mm -hmm. there's both experiences both. 100%. 100%. I've is done there, both. Is there one that has brought you better success in your heart, not necessarily mainstream or radio success? Is there one that works better for you? you or, mean in, the pro, in the process of it? Yeah, that process, whether it's uh, that light goes off of, man, I, that, I'm sad right now. This is a song. Or those sessions are either more productive than the other. They're both productive. The one that does it for me is the single song that moves me that I might like. Here's a, here's a good example. I was raised by my grandparents. Um, he pastored a church for 63 years. Same, the same, you know, the same church, same guy, never changed. Amazing guy. He was from Oklahoma and um, his name was Ray Holton. Amazing guy. And he, uh, I remember my uncle Frank, we, we were standing at his casket. And I, I'm just giving you, just telling you exactly how it went down. And my uncle Frank standing there, Frank Salas, he's we're standing there and all these pictures were around younger pictures of my grandfather and this and that, you know, he loved outdoors, loved hunting, all that stuff. And he goes, man, look at him as a kid there in that picture. And, you know, and then well, watching him get old, you know, watching what happened to him. He goes, well, you know what they say? Once a man, twice a child. And I wrote that down. I went, I'm going to write that once a man. We're all once a man, we're twice, twice children. We become in this world as children. We go out as children, right? Yeah. And so 
<clears throat> I had that idea and I was just batting it around. I happened to be writing one day with two of my favorite writers in town, Casey Bethard and Monty Criswell, which I'll get them to Cowboy Revival. They're both great writers. And I told him that title and he's like, Oh my God. And we started talking about it and, you know, started coming up with the words and the story that everybody would relate to just about grandpa. And just, you know, uh, what's the chorus of the song? I mean, it's on the spot. I'm trying to think of, uh, uh, you know, we came up with, uh, it's a full circle. It's a full circle ride. Kind of crazy coming back from 18, 18 to 80. I can see the dreams in his eyes and the innocence. He went from a kid to a dad, to a kid again looking for a long gone song that he loves just messing with my radio dial once a man, twice a child, but it's, it, it, it comes from, you know, he was, you know, you know, he was, you know, once upon a time he was Superman. He had me on his shoulders and now I'm, I'm carrying him and driving him into town to get him out of grandma's here for a while. Once a man, twice a child, it's that kind of stuff. And so those that hit home and Scotty McCreary just cut that song. Oh, he and, did. Uh, yeah, he did. So it should be coming out. So look for that one. I mean, those are the one of the songs that I go, in relation to what you're saying, that one moment, that one idea, that one song, instead of just a, a session, just being able to go, hey, I remember me and my grandfather, he started getting old. I remember, you know, I used to have to start baiting his hooks and we'd go fishing. True. So we put it in there. You know, he won't hold still with that rod and wheel and I'm trying to bait his hook. You know, and that's, we put that stuff that was meant something to us, you know, and he's got his own, he's got his own toolbox when, you know, when I'm trying, when I, when I pop the hood on that truck, he's got his own toolbox and all that kind of stuff. He did. He never used them, but that's true. That happened, you know, and it's all the stuff that we got to experience that I know that everybody else that had a grandfather or a loved one get old, they experienced. And that was just really cool to be able to put that in song because I think everybody relate to that. Uh, I, I'm a Scotty McCreary fan. I think he does do country music. <laughs> he, he, well. does he does country, he does country music very well. And yeah. matter of fact, matter of fact, the guy that wrote Twice a Child, one, the Monty Criswell, you, you know the uh, Scotty song, Five More Minutes. Five More Minutes, minutes. great song. Yeah. Great song. Monty Criswell was one of the writers of that song. Hmm. So, so yeah, it's, 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 uh, I'm, I'm excited about that one. I want you to hear it. It's great. We need to get, let, let's get Scotty on my show next year. Not yours, my show. No, let's do Not it. Yours. Hey, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Hey, I'm all for helping you too, man. I'm all for. I love you. I love what you stand for. I love what you've brought to rodeo. I mean, I wish I could sit here and talk to you about what you've done because that's a, I come from, I come from rodeo and to make a name. My dad rodeoed. I grew up rodeoing. Um, all my friends did. And I'm to make a name in rodeo. It's a small percentage. It's very hard. It's harder than the music business. Very, very hard. And you think, you that, you think that's a good topic. You think so, huh? It, I do. I do think, I do think so. I mean, how many, how many names in a rodeo, how many people rodeo that come out of rodeo that, that make a niche for themselves in rodeo or a name? Come on, really? That you remember. Yeah. That you remember. And you've done what? that. You've what? done that. You got to step out of the box. You got to think outside the barrel once in a while. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But That's you had to get, That's you had where to get inside that barrel and be willing to do it. Right. And that was tough. I wouldn't do that. I'd rather be on the back of them. They can't hurt you, but they can hurt you when, when you're on the ground. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, you, you, it's pretty amazing, Flint, what you've done. I mean, really think about it. I'll tell you, I, there's a point. I'm getting to a point in my career. I really love doing this almost uh, more because it's and, new and, to me. It's, and you know, and you're going to be successful because you're doing it right now. Here you go again. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm friends and I bring this up a lot because I do consider him a friend. I'm friends with Mark Wills. Good One of guy. my favorite, he, he's been on that. We've done a podcast with him right. and we really, he's the first one that was able to describe to me. Uh, I said, why does music mean so much? Or how do we connect to music? And he says, it's got, it has to touch an emotion. It has yeah, to touch an emotion. Right. Whether it's, like I said, it's heartbreak. That's what it touches. It's, it's some people, here, here, here's what, when we were talking about country music earlier, I've always said recently, and I do think we're gravitating back the other way. Recently, I have said the problem with music right now is there's no attempt to touch an emotion. Sitting on a tailgate drinking beer uh, around, around the bonfire, that's not emotion. That's in the now. That's like, what are we doing now? Uh, Nailed it. Nailed it. I wish you were in the music business. <laughs> yeah, that's Nailed just it. living in the moment. Nailed it. We've had, we've had a thousand songs like that. How many, how many more songs are we going to write about that? They all have their place. Maybe they will again, too. But 
you're right. There's nothing that nails the emotion anymore. Very few. Five more minutes did. And it was what song, what was it, almost voted song of the year? Great song. Hey, how about the house that built me, Miranda Lambert? Uh, won, what, song of the year? There, you want to talk about a heartstring? Who can't I, relate to that? My who? gosh. I, the guy that wrote that is Tom Douglas, one of my buddies, an amazing writer. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I, we, I'm saying there's room for more of that. Would you not agree? I'm sure your listeners Completely. would too. Completely. And, yeah. you know, so Mark and I, on, on this podcast, he said, uh, uh, weird, he said, but my emotion is sad. You know, he's got, wish you were here. Yeah. Don't laugh at me. Uh, yeah. You know, his, yeah. he said, for some reason, that's my emotion that I go to. Do you have an emotion that you got? What's your go-to emotion that touches you in a song? Do you have one? Uh, nostalgia and sad too. Mm. I, lo I love, I love, I love to memories. I love to go down memory lane on the good things. You know what I mean? Yeah. The way things were. I love that whole angle of a song, mm -hmm. you know, just something that could be from your childhood or like, man, I wish I could just, you know, I wish I would have wrote wish a buck was still silver, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. You know, God, I love that. You know, That's who's, my emotion. you know, who does a lot of, and you can tell me better than I know. And uh, a guy I've met that I think is a good guy, Brad Paisley. He's huh? on a kick almost, I will say this because <laughs> I can, because my name's on the sign, um, <laughs> that he, he does nostalgia that I can relate to almost to a point where I'm like, all right, Brad, kick out another love song here because sure. I, I, the quirky sure. little mm -hmm. um, remember this, remember this, remember this, now, now gravitate back. But he's big into nostalgia. And he I don't is. know if he writes all those songs. I would imagine he has some writer credit on those songs. He, he does. He's got some writers he writes with. Brad's a good writer. He's a really good writer, and, and you, you are correct. And, 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 yeah, and get on to a love song, too. I mean, we don't want too much of that. That's hard being a writer because that's where you have to shift gears as a writer because I like sad like Wills does. I like real. But then sometimes you, it's hard, Flint, because if you got an artist coming to you going, hey, guys, I got those two songs covered maybe on my record, but I need something fun, party up tempo. Well, what is fun party up tempo? A girl, a beer, a Friday night, and a truck. And so, how how many more ways can you talk about? You know what I mean? Yeah. So see, I think I Brad know. Paisley probably. It's funny when we talk. Then I think of when oh, you yeah. think of a girl and a truck. Yeah. In my mind, the one song that does touch an emotion that talks about that is. Yeah. Uh, I got some big news. The bank finally came through. <laughs> I'm holding the keys to a brand new Chevrolet. <laughs> brand new Chevrolet right. It's mud on the tires. tires it's, right. not, it's not party it up. It, it's the same topic. It's the same topic, but it's the way he says it. That's brilliant. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I agree. Yeah. And that's great. And that's great songwriting. Uh, and that's great. It's great. I got it. I, uh, you know what I'm on right now? I'm, in, I'm, in, <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed that you picked that out. And then you sit here and tell me you don't know if you could do it. You just did it. You, you're, un, you're understanding, hey, one of the greatest songwriters I ever met and got to write with, still around, named Kerry Kurt Phillips. Writing a song with him was a two or three day thing. And he told me, he always said to me, he goes, the trick is being able to say it, what you're trying to say without saying it at all. That's the trick. And, I, and just like that, you're talking about the girl on the Friday night, but the song's about mud on the tires. Yeah. You follow me? Exactly. What he what he told me, you get. So yes, you could write a song. Hmm. Yes, I'll tell you what. <laughs> if I write a song and make a million, you I won't even know how to spell bull riding. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my let's. I think my emotion and you. I think you know this. In our little bit, we're friends, but don't spend a lot of time together. We get those right. ten days, and right. I think right. you know my emotion is heartache it is that's the one that really touches i can and nothing evokes emotion i i feel bad for people who don't have a place in their life for music i, I, I feel bad i'm like how how do you vent how do you do you know how often i have got in my car driven put pandora on my phone and cried my eye i mean i hate to reveal that <laughs> cried my eyes out because there's I put it on love song, and then I, then you're okay. I, I feel bad. I think there is a huge hole in people who don't leave room for music. I agree 100%, and I do it just like you my whole life.
It's moved me when I wanted to get in a mode. I've had those moments. You know what, Flint? I still do. So we can admit that. And absolutely. I mean, it, it, people that don't have music, I mean, come on. How do you, that's, that's tugging at your heartstrings. That's, that's the release. That's letting you know that every, there's somebody out there that wrote that song and sang in that song that feels just like you do. Yeah, it, it is. It's, uh, it's like, woo, somebody wrote that song. I'm not in this alone. That's right. That's um, right. I think there's, it, I think, yeah. So. And you do, and you are, and that is heartache. That's you, because that goes back to what I said. You have a big heart. People with big hearts have heartaches. And so, and, and you're great for song ideas because you gave me a great one that ended up getting cut. <laughs> <laughs> which is awesome uh, i don't want to dive into that but i just remember telling my well, wife going going boy trent boy boy i feel sorry for flint man he just golly i mean it just it's cold the way he was done i mean almost cold this beer i'm drinking and i remember <laughs> I, I i remember i remember uh you know going to the right with uh, my buddy john singleton and luke combs and going i got this idea called beer almost as cold as you and, holy crap i like that and we ended up writing it. <laughs> it's on his new record cold as you yeah, you gave um, me that idea. I mean, just by what you were going through, just by listening to your story. Yeah. So you're welcome. You're thank you. You're, you're thank welcome. you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> what a you know talking not to bring in. Well, we can bring in much like my colleagues mean a lot to me. Right. Our, your yours are the same, and a guy that means a lot. I know means a lot to you. You had him on your show, and he means a lot to me too as a as a friend and a songwriter. The most redneck cowboy he, sh he should be leading a white mule with pots and pans going prospecting win varble but how does the mind work I, you you look at win varble and that guy he sits on a porch of a log cabin whittling a stick that's yep. what you picture and yeah. then, and then he kicks out waiting on a woman mm -hmm. uh he you know he wrote him and daryl worley wrote have you forgotten Great. Great, but then his mind goes and red high heels, a, oh, a, a, a song cut by a, how does a mind that, creative that's crazy, man. He's just a creative guy and he's exactly right. And that's the best I've heard him describe. He needs to be up and he needs to be going up and down music row with a donkey, uh, a mule, freaking pots and pans and a guitar on there peddling his songs just like some old italian in italy right hey, hey you whippersnappers i got a song i want to peddle you my golly that's my him. golly that's him that's totally there's, him there's songs in them there hills look at us <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, i would but don't you i'd love to have him on here right now uh, uh, uh that's a good uh, i might have him on here you, you, you need <laughs> It'd be awesome to three-way call him in on this and just get him going. Yeah. That is one of the most funniest guys. Oh, he is he's hysterical. Hysterical. He is yes. hysterical. and amazing the, the stuff he's kicked out. Um how would you define in today's world? Listen, there's a lot of people. I think 98% of the people in Montana would define success in the music business as I heard you on the radio. I heard you on mainstream radio. Cody Johnson, you know, Cody Johnson was popular with college kids for, for three years before they plopped one of his songs on the radio. You know, my girls, the, the, the kids sitting here working with, they all knew Cody Johnson. Before he. Before mainstream right. radio. Right, right, right. How do you, in today's world, how do you define success in the music business? It, it can't purely be, Am I making a lot of money? It can't purely be, am I on mainstream radio? Where do we throw that in? Where do we define that? I would say, are you ha is it happy? It's, it's not about the money. Are you happy being you? Does it make you happy doing what you do? Are you fulfilled? Are you complete? Whether you make, you know, $10,000 a year at this or hundred, hundred million at this year, you know what I'm saying? If it makes you happy and complete, I would say that success it doesn't necessarily have to mean you're on, you know, terrestrial radio. And it doesn't mean, uh, if you got an, I, I personally like the underground grassroots following. I love that. I love when I was on stage with Shania, that was great. It was cool. You know, what my favorite times were, and I love her. She's amazing. My favorite times were playing little honky tonks where nobody yeah. cared. You know, it's like, it's like, I miss that. That's what I miss. It was that I look once you kind of get up there and you look where you, where you came from, I'm like, 
where was the success? You know, where was the happiest time I was most happiest? And it was down there. It was like getting there to get it. There's a song title. Um, you know what I mean? It's the getting there to get it, right? Get, get to the mountain. It's the climb, right? Yeah. That's, for me, it was. Mm -hmm. So, and it still is. I mean, it's, you know, these, I still have wins and losses and win some and lose some. Probably lose more than I win, you know, but it's, you know. It's, it's but, and you got to know that. I, I, my girls are great rodeo they've had great success in rodeo um they're on the college yes. rodeo team montana state we told them early on and their mom more than i did she picked up on this she said you better learn how to lose and when you're a rodeo kid you you better not it learning how to handle success that's easy it's learning how to lose because you're going to lose way more than you're going to win and that goes that goes to everything doesn't it yeah. And you know, I mean, I remember, uh, it does. And we're, we're going to write that learn how to lose is a great title. That's going to be the first song we write. Um, so I'm, I'm just writing that down. Oh, that's, right. Right. That's, yeah. you're, that's, <laughs> you know, that's great. Um, yeah, that's great. Flint. Um, it's true. And it also goes, I mean, you remember Gary LaFue, 1970 Lately. world champ. Oh, sure. I know. Yeah. The champ. Um, He's just champ. Yeah. Freaking Gary. So I, I lived at his place for summers growing up, you uh -huh. know, and, 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 I remember he used to tell those kids, I mean, we were trying to, we were later in high school rodeo and, and filling permits, all the buddies I hung around his son, Brett, and all those guys and all of our friends, Clancy, all those dudes. And we'd work at his school so we could ride bulls for free, you know, and when the school was done, you know, that kind of thing. And he used to tell those kids and it made sense in today, what you're saying. He said, what makes a great bull riding champ is all the buck offs that it took getting you there. Yeah. You, you can't learn to win unless you get bucked off. You want, you learn something every time you get bucked off and that makes the champ, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the losing. It's the losing is where it helps you be a winner. That's exactly right. I think that's right. Yeah, that is. Yeah, completely. Um, I don't want to keep you all day, but one last oh, no. kind of, I mean, we could talk about writing songs because I'm making you a lot of cash right now. Cause I've floated you like three different ideas. I got more. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Listen, I got a write, lot of shit going on in here. <laughs> Listen, write those titles down because we're going to write them. Okay. All right. Matter of fact, matter of fact, you know who you and the learning to lose thing, you know what? That'd be, a, that'd be a good one for you and I and win Varble to write. Actually true. I'd love to. Yeah. And oh, yeah, we'll do that. Well, I'm, I I'm going to call win today. Uh, honestly, uh, sincerely and not, I would love to sit in a room with you and win Varble and watch the process. I'm a real process guy. I, I would love to watch the process and go, Hey, what about this? What about, you know, just well, that's, what you, that, that's what you need to do. You need to go, Hey guys, what if you said this? Yeah. Well, yeah, I love that angle. Let's say it like this. Or we got to get the, you know, the syllables to work for them, whatever melody we come up with. But yeah, you, you will, we'll do that. I'm gonna call win today and we'll set up a time. Okay. Well, there's a legion. A legion flies direct to Nashville from Bozeman, Montana. I'm in. I'm kidding. But, <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, a hey, legion. Well, we fly, hey, I'll fly to Bozeman. Okay. A legion, the Walmart of the sky. I'm telling the you. Walmart of the sky. <laughs> uh, okay, one last thing, just because I, I want your take on this. Okay. Going through my childhood, I mean, I played 45s. I had a purple. Um, I remember playing 45s, and then they started to make them colored. I had a purple 45 <laughs> yellow electric light orchestra, Sweet Talking Woman. Was a purple. Oh, yeah. Isn't that funny? I remember that. <laughs> That's awesome. It was the 45. I had uh, Please, Mr. Please by Olivia Newton-John, Lucille um, by Kenny Rott. Just one after. On. You could stack them, and they'd play one. That was our way of, of mixing, whatever. Hey, you will, know, you admit to your, will you admit to your listeners that, come on, you, did you, you had to listen to the Bee Gees, too. Heaven. No, nobody nobody gets, gets too much heaven no more. 1979-ish. Was that not 79. great? I thought the Bee Gees were great unbelievable and they were they were geniuses you know they're geniuses yeah um so you go records you had eight tracks then cassettes were the new thing then cds now nobody they're they're you know nostalgically putting out cassettes and vinyl the vinyl's big again it's getting cool again yeah how is how has that changed music or affected in a positive or negative way the way we have access to music without going out and purchasing that in your hand item? Well, digitally now, which is today, it's made it more accessible to people. Anybody can get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the positive. We can get music where, you know, as a consumer, you may, you remember buying the records, how we used to buy them. 
you might have three songs or four songs on there you like, but you had to buy the whole record, right? Right. You, you thumb through the. You thumb through, the, right? So now you can just go get the three or four songs you like. You don't have to buy the whole record. So, I mean, that's good for the consumers. What it did for Nashville and songwriters, especially, it killed uh, our royalties because people think we're just gazillionaire riches. We're not. Songwriters aren't. It's, it's, uh, it, it hurt us because we made our money on the mechanicals of those records that hard, the CDs, the, the tapes, the vinyl, you know, the hard copy of that thing, you know? So with that's kind of obsolete now. So how do you determine what a stream is? How do you determine what the worth of a stream? And it's a tough thing. It's in Congress. So that's the negative part of it. Um, and I think the negative for me, I mean, maybe it's me just being our age, which we're not old and we're, we're not young, but, there was something about having that record where you felt you owned that record and you saw the, you opened it up and you were, you had skin in the game. You know what I'm saying? Am I saying that right? It's like yeah. you were part of that band. You had ownership where you could see who wrote that song. You could see the thank you notes and you could read in the pictures. And it just like, Oh, it's like, I'm not at the concert, but I open up this record while I'm playing it. It's like, Holy crap. I'm right there with them. I mean, there's some, that, that tangible visible thing that I miss about having records. You know what I mean? Or the CD. I agree. Um, um, they don't, the kids don't get to experience that anymore. And the ones that do go, that's awesome. And they, they all of a sudden they're buying records, you know? Yeah, so there's I, pros and cons. I, I don't know who pointed this out. It sparked an in. Somebody mentioned that. It might have been Garth Brooks in an interview, but made me think about it. And I agree. You know what? Every album, and, and until you hear somebody who's put an album together talk about it, you probably never realized it. Until you put that that CD in your car as you were driving across the country and listened to the whole album straight through without yep. skipping. Every album tells it. There's a lot of thought goes into those songs and the order they're in. And that album tells a story. So when you only download three songs and listen to the ones you want, you're missing the story that artist is trying to tell in those songs that they put on there. 100%. And you're not, and you, also you're not getting to know the artist. Right. That's where the true artists were made. And that's a great point, Flint, because, you know, today, you know how they say, well, you know, an artist today in country music, we don't have the big artists and the big stars anymore. You know, uh, they only have like one or two or three or four songs and it's over with. You know what I mean? And so it's like because those records aren't out, you're not listening to the true story. Just like you just said, you're not getting to know that artist. And this artist is not being able to be defined and given the chance to define himself because the listeners are going, they're only hearing a quarter of the story. Oh, I only like two or three songs of that record. Go listen to the whole record. You're going to love the artist part of him. You're going to get who, know who the guy is or the girl is. Go follow them. Go listen to who they are. Let them tell their story. They got something to say. You're only hearing a little bit. And in those days when, when we were listening to records and kids today that are listening to the whole records, those are the, kid, those are the artists that are being, uh, becoming major epic icons in, in the music business like Garth and George. Those guys were artists. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Chesney, all those guys, they have full blown records that people will listen to. And I think it's, I hope I'm saying that right. It's like, I, yeah, I think so. I, you know, I, Hey, my, my favorite, not to get off on this, I'll let you go pretty soon, but no, no. my favorite Eric church song yeah. never was a single. It's a, a song well, called those I've loved. Oh, I've heard it. Uh, yeah. Never was a single where the they're standing. He comes out of school and his grandpa was dying, you know, and he's become, one of those I've loved. Then it's, then the next verse is about the girlfriend becoming one of those I've loved. And then mm -hmm. what it circles back to is the songs he writes uh -huh. are those he's loved. That's what he, I, I don't, it gives me goosebumps. It, it's the, no, I know, song. I know that, that, but that's why Eric church is, is an artist. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you, you understand the B sides, you go listen to them. If people would listen to the whole record and buy the whole records of these artists, you would, they, we'd have more, real artists out there with long careers we wouldn't have the oh man he was great he only had like three songs because nobody ever really got to know him or her yeah. you know what i mean mm. so i don't know that's my take on it yeah listen uh, about that forever i know listen i want you to know that i have made my living i was a school teacher for a couple of years but my living has been oh, God, the I western sports industry rodeo pbr you know now i do a show there's a I reason understand. there's a reason on my show, every day on my Outside the Barrel show at the NFR, I like to have a musical artist. I think a lot of people who help me with the show think it's just, oh, it's a good way to end. It's No, because 
my true passion is, to, as you can tell, <laughs> this really means something in my life. Yeah. And I talk about the people that I feel bad for them because they don't have a place in their hearts or in their, their time for music because right. it's done so much for me. And me too. I know it has for you too. So, yeah. uh, so, this, yeah. so this means a lot. I appreciate it. We'll do it again. Please. And, and man, let me tell you something. You mean a lot to me. And then the, and the mark you've made in the rodeo world to big fans like myself um, like I said, I go back, it's so hard to make a name in a rodeo and you've done it and you're loved by a lot of people. And I know you make a joke about that, but you really are. And you affect these, these, this generation coming up. I'm watching my kids watch people like you. And when they get our age, they're going to look back and go, man, Flint Rasmussen, he was so great. You remember, I mean, there's, you can't find guys like that anymore that I grew up, like we're talking about records and, <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? You're going to do that. I'm, you're doing that Flint. And I know, I know you don't have an ego. You're an modest guy, and I know you got a big heart. But I'm telling you, I'm not greasing you. I'm telling you, I'm watching the kids, and I'm watching what you're doing. And God bless you, and that is amazing. And I'm a huge fan, and I love you, and you're my buddy. I'd do anything for you. Well, it's great. Okay, well, I'll, I'll book my flight to Nashville. <laughs> Come on, I let's sit in. Uh, that's a deal. I want to sit in. I, I, I do. I'll, I, I just I want promise to you. I promise. No, no, you're going to write. I promise you. I'm going to call Win Varble today. Okay. Well, I'm going to put a matter of fact, I'm going to put the three of us on a text thread today. Okay. Sounds perfect to me. <laughs> gonna be Shane, great. Shane minor, my friend, you're successful. And I know you're successful because you could afford a tractor because it's over your left shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's do it again. Thanks. You know, welcome to my world. According to Flint, you're the best, my friend. Thanks, buddy. You are too. God bless you, Flint. I love you, man. Thanks for having me on here. Thanks, man. You got it.